Hello everyone, my name is Ksenia Komjanovic and I'm here to give some advice to young musicians. We're going to have a conversation in about four categories. We're going to talk about organization and your musical identity and practicing and finally some extra musical skills that you need to have in order to succeed in today's world. So buckle up. The first thing that I want to talk about is organization. It is extremely important to be organized. I, I know that's redundant, but guess what? If you get in a car, it doesn't matter if it is the fanciest, best car that runs on, you know, rocket fuel. If you have no idea where you're going or how you're going to get there. So as musicians, what do we need? Well, you know, we have this uh, beautiful gift of literacy and the ability to, to read and write that we've been given. So I think we should use that because there is a saying in Serbian, and pardon me, it might sound a bit harsh, but the saying sort of goes, dumb people remember, smart people write down. What do we need to do? We need to actually physically record what we are doing. We need to identify our goals verbally, on paper, and then we need to sort of reverse engineer, plan how we're going to get there. And the way that I do it is that I use three main tools. I use a journal, I use a calendar, and I use a recording device. Why do I use these three? Well, because I believe that you have to have tools that are going to help you plan ahead, so that are going to let you see what is going to come next and that will let you see your three month plan, your six month plan, one year plan, whatever it is. And then I need a tool that will help me self reflect on what I am doing right now. And finally, I need a tool that will literally record what I'm doing. And so I use a calendar. And this has everything spelled out for me so that I can see it and go, okay, I know exactly when I'm supposed to be teaching, when juries are due, when grades are due, when my recording is, and so on. This is super, super important. So this is not to self-reflect. This is to plan. Then I still use a journal. And you can buy a fancy journal, a journal that's made specifically for musicians, or you can just use a notebook and write in whatever you need to write in. This is where I keep track of when I practice, how much I practice, and other parameters that I need to keep track of, such as my tempi, for example, or um, the movements that I'm working on, or whatever, where am I with the memorization process, for example. These are incredibly important. And this is where I actually write down, what did I do today? And the third thing that I use is, my phone. That is my recording device. What is brilliant about it is that it's always in your pocket, always ready to go, and it can record both audio and video. Why is this important? Well, guess what? Music is not only a sonic art form. We as humans have not been experiencing music only through our ears or only through listening since the beginning of time. In fact, we had to be there to see it and hear it up until about 100 years ago or so, when the invention of recording came about, and we were able to isolate music and experience it only through our ears. Okay. I'm of course talking about only people who are not visually impaired, right? But in any case, for those of us who are not, we have been experiencing music through all senses. And in fact, if you speak to, say, people who are hard of hearing or perhaps are completely deaf, they will tell you that they too can experience music. They can experience it through their body, through the feeling, the sensation of vibration as well as through their eyes. So that is why I think it's super important to record video. 
What you want to do is you want to be able to focus on playing and not focus on judging yourself so that then you can look at the recording and then go fully into, okay, judgmental mode. I'm now going to evaluate what happened. You want to also be able to do audio only because you want to take a moment and not be distracted by the visual aspect of it all. You want to focus only on your sound. The third little bit of advice that I have in there, which is like a little trick, is that you want to not only watch yourself perform with the sound on and listen to yourself perform only, you also want to only watch yourself with the sound off. Why? It is because obviously we're an extremely physical art form. The way we move will initiate sound and will sculpt sound. And so it is absolutely impossible that you will look like a robot and yet sound like a river. You have to move fluidly in order to evoke fluidity out of your instrument. So those would be my three little tools that I always use to make sure that I am on top of things. So the second thing that we're going to talk about is your musical identity. And this is something that has confused many, many, many students. Um, and I remember it being a little bit confusing myself when I was in high school, for example, and even in early college when people would say, you know, oh, it matters so much what you play because it says something about you. And I never understood that that was really in my hands that much because I had very proactive teachers and they would you know, keep throwing music my way. So I kept thinking, well, what is there to think about? You know, I play concerts that are already programmed by other people and those are my engagements. That's how I work, that's how I make money. So what is there to think about? If you want to make a solo career or a chamber career, or you want to be in charge of the music that you're playing, well, then you definitely have to think about it. Where do you start with building your musical identity? Lucky for you, it is not separate from your identity in general. So what you need to look at is, okay, what are my interests? What do I like just in general? Do I like to read comics? Do I like to watch movies? Do I like animals? And you might think, what does this have to do with music? Well, everything has to do with music. You'll see that there are these examples of cat pianos. It's really weird to do it, but you know, it exists, sort of, in theory. Then there are underwater experiences. If you thought that you couldn't play music underwater, well, yes, you can. And you can make money doing that. And someone's already doing that. Or perhaps you're into ping pong. And Hikiko wrote a concerto for you that you might love. So you know what? Think outside the box and write down what do you like to do because you're in luck music will marry anything. You like movies? Music interacts with that. Theater? Yeah. There's something for everybody. Music is there for everything from weddings to funerals to, you know, births. Music accompanies every moment of our lives. So think about what is it that excites you and write that thing down. So you start off with what you already like. That's great. Don't stop there. You need to grow your taste. You need to constantly evolve. And what does this mean? This means that you have to go out and attend not only events that are already appealing to you, but perhaps those that you know nothing about. So this means that you will sometimes sit down with, say, a friend, and you will ask them to play you their favorite album. Perhaps you don't know anything about this band or, or performer, it doesn't matter. But that is exactly the point. You need to sit down and you need to start transplanting other people's knowledge and love of other music or art forms, doesn't matter, into yourself. If you remain open enough, this can absolutely happen. So perhaps you're the kind of person that thinks, well, you know what? I don't get jazz. I only like drum core and I only like metal and jazz seems like a great excuse to just make mistakes and not take any responsibility for it, which of course is wrong. 
Well, you know what you need to do? You need to go with a friend who listens to jazz and go to a jazz gig if possible, or perhaps you're gonna just sit down safely socially distanced and you're gonna listen to an album and you're gonna ask them, what do they hear? What is so interesting to them? Why is this special? The best way to learn is to latch onto an emotional hook. That's why we are so keen on receiving these influences from people we care about, whether it's your partner or your friend or your parent, sibling, family member, doesn't matter. You need to go to people you care about and you need to listen to what they listen to. One thing that I used to do a lot was read other people's favorite books. This gave me several great things. It gave me access to authors I wouldn't have normally thought of. Genres, I don't think about reading that much. And it allowed me to learn something about this person that I care about. Because what they read and what they enjoy tells you a lot about them. So not only is this a great way to expand on your tastes, it is also a way for you to become closer with someone. So it's a win-win situation and I absolutely recommend doing that. Another thing that you need to consider, of course, is exploring other art forms. Music does not exist in a vacuum and it frequently interacts with dance and moving pictures, right, and everything. So super important that you go ahead and do that because books will teach you about narration and character development in details. Dance will teach you about the poetry of movement something that is very relatable to us. Photography will teach you about the magic of the moment, patience of waiting to capture that ideal split second that tells a story within a frame. Painting will teach you about how style is much more important than what is depicted. Because not everything is about realism and we don't need that. Picasso's Cubist period is interesting, not because of what is depicted, but how it is depicted. And in many ways, you are the performer. It is not what you're depicting because a million other people can do that. They can take the same piece and depict it. It is how you do that that will separate you from it. So in a way, you're a painter. Another way to develop your musical identity is to spend time with things you really dislike. So you should be more like Luciano Berio, famous composer. And here's what he did. So on one day, he gave a two hour lecture about how Beethoven's Seventh Symphony is the greatest gift God has given to this planet. And then on the next day, he gave a two hour lecture about how Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, so the same piece of art, is the most flawed attempt at music in history. And yes, this tells us about how funny he was, but also about his ability to argue for and against a piece of music. And this is what you need to learn how to do too. If you only represent one side, then you have many blind spots. You really, really, really don't get it then. It is okay to dislike things. It is absolutely fine to understand that this is not, for example, aesthetically pleasing to you, but you need to understand why something might teach you, why something might be valuable to other people, why this thing might actually be important. And you need to be able to argue both sides. So an exercise would be, Go ahead, find three pieces you really dislike. Genuinely find good things in them. Super important. Here's another reason why this is so important. I'm personally not too keen on the social media image. It's perfectly fine, of course. If you do that and you do that really well, more power to you. However, what I think is that your social media image or any perception that other people have of you should lean on who you actually are. So develop yourself for the sake of yourself so that then you could go out there and present yourself to the world and say, hi, 
this is who I am. And this is what I like to do. And this is what I'd like to do with you, for example. Allow yourself to do the things that you like. That is perfectly okay. And you can take things into your own hands. You don't have to wait for your teacher to give you something to play. Of course, they're going to give you great stuff and they're going to give you stuff that you need to work on so that you grow because you don't have that perspective. You don't have their knowledge. You don't have their experience. You have to trust them, but you can also be guided by what you like. So while you can spend an X amount of time working on what someone else has prescribed for you, it doesn't mean that you should never dedicate time to whatever music you wish to play you wish to interact with. And it doesn't matter if it's within the realm of percussion music or not. Play whatever you like. Stay in touch with what you like. Stay curious. Look for new music all the time. Explore other instruments. Express yourself. Music is not there so that you could have some trick to perform in front of other people and then they yay, give you a score afterwards and then someone claps or doesn't. That's not what it's there for. It is a mode of self-expression. So please do not forget how important your artistic loves are. Write down what you like. Okay, it could be you know, music and tattoos. And you might think there's no connection, but guess what? Boom, you Google it and there is. Google is your best friend. You certainly want to explore that. See how you can marry those things that you like into one thing that you might be known for. Interact with your favorite works of art. Perhaps your favorite piece is written for piano. You can arrange it for your instrument. Play it. That's how and why I did the Rite of Spring for marimba and piano. It's because it wasn't enough for me to just be in the orchestra and play a tam-tam part. I wanted to play more. No one's done it before, so I made it myself, for myself. I tailored the music that I like to fit what I do, to fit me. And it's been one of the most pleasant, most gratifying experiences of my life. Perhaps you like a painting. Write some music to it. Try to describe it musically. It doesn't matter whatever it is, transcribe it, arrange it for your instrument, interact with it, improvise to it, do something to interact with your favorite work of art. And you wouldn't be the first, I'm not telling you anything new. Composers have been doing this for hundreds of years. Allow yourself to interact with things that you like. Create a space in which you and what inspires you can do a little creative dance. So, the third thing that we're going to talk about is practice tips, especially for busy schedules or perhaps you don't have access to instruments. They're not as readily available or due to COVID there's, there's issues, whatever it is. Here are some ideas for you. Number one, step away from the instrument. If you have it, stop using it to learn music. When you do that, you probably look like this. And the reason why that looks like that is because you are trying to process the music mentally and also mechanically poke it on the instrument. That doesn't work. You are trying to lift twice as much. There is a reason why the music that you've already listened to a lot before is a lot easier to learn. It's because mentally you already know it. You already recognize it. There are at least shapes. You don't have to have perfect pitch to be able to simply pick out the notes on a keyboard, for example. By the mere fact that you've been exposed to it a lot and that you intuitively now understand its shape, the interactions, the structure, whatever, you're going to have an easier time learning it. So do yourself a favor and actually look at music the way conductors do. They look at the music away from the orchestra and they don't have an orchestra to practice with, right? They have to prepare the music themselves in their head and then they go and then they have a limited number of rehearsals and a performance. We 
should be able to do as much of that as possible. Read the music first, look at it first, even if it's minimal, even if you just scan through and you notice modulations and time signature changes and the form, whatever. This might mean that you're gonna employ mental practice. And that means that you're standing there and just looking at the music and you're practicing mentally. And also, huge reveal, when you practice physically, you're also practicing mentally because guess what? All of your physical impulses, the things that make your hands move, come from your head. So you need to train this first because if this misfires, this is gonna glitch and then the music is gonna glitch. It doesn't go the other way around. So incredibly important to practice mentally. And this might mean that you're gonna do visualization. So you're gonna, for example, you're just gonna stand in front of the instrument and you're not gonna move your hands, but you're gonna think about the music that you're supposed to be playing. Or you're gonna close your eyes and you're gonna imagine a keyboard or whatever you're playing, doesn't matter, your, your setup. And you're gonna imagine playing it because this has to work first. This comes second. This is a reaction to what happens in your head, okay? The second way to practice, something that's been really helpful to me, is to practice vocally. I frequently memorize pieces through somization, right? So the way I memorize Bach is, for example, I can, I can literally recite it. Re, fa, la, fa, mi, re, do, mi, so, la, si, la, so, fa, mi, so, si, do, mi, si, la, so, fa, mi, fa, so, la, fa, re, do, si, la. That's the opening of the D minor cello suite, for example, the prelude. I know that I could wrap that in the middle of the night. And so for me, those are note names. They're connected to obviously what I'm playing. So I no longer have to have muscle memory because muscle memory abandons me. But this thing doesn't, it's engraved in my brain. So sometimes simply doing that or singing, which is perfectly fine to sing, absolutely sing. Even if you can't sing very well, it's super important that you sing. If you can say it, if you can sing it, you can play it more easily. And then lastly, the third thing that I do is that I translate the music to another instrument or to another surface. So if I'm playing something on the marimba, I go practice that on the piano. Why? Because it takes away my physical way of playing the marimba, right? It takes away my muscle memory. I have to think only about the music. The same goes for, you know, if you're playing a setup. Well, it's really hard to play a setup if you're not hearing the exact same sounds that you're used to, for example. But that's exactly where you should practice that. Go and just play on a blank surface. Nothing that changes pitches for you, but it's a way to practice your stickings and to practice, for example, just your muscles, where you have to override the auditory information that comes back in and you just play, you just move, you perform the choreography, but you don't expect to hear the sound back. And that will solidify the way you learn music. It's going to be way better, trust me. And finally, if you don't have access to instruments, program some music that doesn't need it. We're talking about standard instruments, right? Maybe you don't have access to a vibraphone right now or whatever, timpani. There is plenty of other music that is available to us. Theatrical pieces, body percussion pieces, things that explore other ways of playing, of performing. And so why not? When you play a body percussion piece, you become better at everything because you're still looking at music. You're still looking at art. You're still looking at rhythms and melodies and everything, everything. <laughs> so don't, don't be stuck in your way of, oh, I, I need to play four mallets. And you know, if that doesn't happen, I'm stuck. No, if a practice pad is all you have, make it into art. If you're on a really busy schedule, it is super important to get to know yourself the way you need to practice to get best results. And why do I say that? Is because even top athletes, top athletes, so I'm talking about, you have Serena Williams, right? She can wipe the floor down with anybody in tennis. She still warms up before everything, yeah? This most athletic human being still warms up. This person 
has a coach still. They know when their body works in the best way possible so that they optimize their practice to constantly improve. She doesn't play in the middle of the night because she's the best, because it's fine, she can do it. And she doesn't skip breakfast because it's fine, she's strong, she can do it. No, she's constantly trying to do better. So for us, think about when does it work best for you to play? To practice and what kind of learning do you need to do is it in the morning do you learn your notes best in the morning then do it then do you like to have a timer set on 20 minutes and a deadline for yourself or it's gonna be like okay i'm gonna learn these four lines in these 20 minutes and that's it boom go whatever it is do what works for you and in the last segment we're gonna talk about some skills that don't necessarily fall into music that are super important for you to be able to succeed okay and so number one i know everybody says this but i'll repeat it because you really need to know this is be nice be kind and considerate here's a scenario for you you're preparing a chamber music concert for example and your partner comes in not prepared you don't want that the next day, a person comes in prepared. Is that better? Definitely. We prefer people who are prepared. Nobody has ever been offended by someone who is respectful and kind. Nobody has ever gone, I really wish that person wasn't nice or that they didn't make my life easier by being on top of their stuff. So there's the not prepared version, the prepared version, and then there's the version that everyone wants to work with. And that is a person who comes in prepared and with a smile on their face and with cookies. And I know, okay, you don't have to bake to bribe your partners into liking you, but there is something special about those people who go the extra mile. And again, this doesn't have to be culinary extra mile. Just to be positive, to be a problem solver, to be optimistic, to try to create a positive experience for the other person is what's going to get you a callback. It's what's going to get you a better gig. It's what's going to get you a recommendation. Think about the person that you want to be. Is it one, two, or with the cookies? Another piece of advice is right. It is extremely important. You're going into art and to be a clear communicator is extremely important, especially in written form, because guess what? That's how you get grants. That's how you get money. That's how you apply for jobs. If you're lucky enough to be born with a love of reading and writing, great, use that. If not, get on it immediately, because again, you have a great performer, great friend, great person who writes really poorly, doesn't communicate well, or same person, but writes really, really, really well. Who's gonna get the gig? person knows how to write. So super important. This will get you scholarships. This will help you in life tremendously. Start writing. And my final piece of advice would be to give what you need. That usually needs a bit of time to sink in. Give what you need. What do I mean by this? You might think that, for example, if you live in a place that is not the cultural mecca of the universe, that there is not a lot of stuff going on and that you wish that there were more concerts or more events of a certain kind. Well, you need to give what you need. You have the opportunity to create those things for other people. For yourself too, you'll get to enjoy them too. But guess what? When you create, you have the ability to establish a platform that assists many who may, might have similar needs. So for me, for example, that has been the podcast, the app percussion podcast that I'm a host on. Now I didn't get to create this podcast, but through doing this thing, interviewing many people from all over the world about percussion, I am giving to the world what I need to. And those are meaningful conversations with many brilliant people from around the world about what I care about. It could be your own 
show. It could be your own series on social media. It could be your own podcast, it could be your own concert series, whatever it is. You're not creating these only for personal benefit. It is something that the entire community can participate in. So think about how you can create communities, how you can benefit other people. It is a very, very special thing to be able to curate such a wonderful experience for everybody. So give what you need. It is incredibly important. And so that's it. Those are my little pieces of advice for young musicians. I hope this has been helpful to you and you're always free to write to me. My email is right there. I am always happy to chat with fellow musicians, young and old, doesn't matter. So thank you to the Valley Percussion Festival for having me and I'm really looking forward to checking out the rest of events that are on. Thanks everyone. Bye.